so I'm a big fan of biology. And one of the reasons I'm such a fan of biology is that evolution comes up with some really amazing answers to some pretty weird questions. Now, I'm going to share with you three problems today, all of them with strange evolutionary solutions. Here's the first one. Imagine you're in a forest. You've lived in that forest for your entire life. You've never met your mother, never met your father, don't know any of your siblings. You've grown up on your own, and that hasn't been a problem. It hasn't bothered you till this point, but you're starting to feel some urges. <laughs> you know it's about that time in life when you need to settle down and make a family. Now, there are certain species out there where that isn't a problem. Simply clone yourself. That's fine. But you know, most species, it takes two to tango, as it were. You need a male and a female, and the two get together, and that's where the babies come from. Now, you're in the forest, you're on your own, you have two basic methods you can use. If you're a frog, if you're a cricket, you yell. You yell nice and loud, and everybody comes to you. That's the way to meet a mate. Most other species, though, it's a case of going out and finding one for yourself. Well, in a lot of cases, that's not too bad, but I want you to meet somebody. This is Tadaran sisyphoides, so it doesn't have a common name, so this is the only one I can use. I'll call it the spider. This spider is found primarily in the southern United States, also down into Central America. And when the male of this species wants to go and find a mate, he's facing some challenges. See, the male spider is about one to two millimeters long, very, very small. The female, on the other hand, of this species is 100 times larger. <laughs> I want you to think about that for a second. <laughs> You're going to find a mate who is 100 times your size, and I'll stress, everything about her is in proportion, <laughs> including her sex organs. Now, you're a male. If everything's in proportion for you, you have a problem, because no matter what they told you, size does matter. <laughs> Luckily, this particular spider has come up with a solution. He has developed sperm-carrying sex organs that are huge. To put it in perspective, if these were on a human being, we'd be talking a pair of basketballs. This leads to its own problems. See, this male, when he wants to go for a walk, it's kind of a drag. <laughs> he, he has two organs that will drag along the ground when he walks up. Now, luckily for him, he's a spider. What can spiders do? Uh, uh, they can make silk. So he spins some silk. This is the gruesome bit. He wraps the silk around the top of one of these two sex organs. He then takes his fangs, sucks out the liquid from inside there. I'm not kidding, this is real. And then the whole thing dries up and falls off. He's, yep, he's now left with one sex organ, with which he then goes off to find the female. Now, this is one of those things, why would this exist, right? Well, it, it, it <laughs> Yeah, who was the first fighter to come up with this is the one I want to, but anyway. Now, this, this led to all kinds of research questions, and Dr. Duncan Urshak at the University of Massachusetts wondered, does this really make any difference? You know, does the spider do better? It's still got some drag, but not as much. So what Dr. Urshak did was he took some of these male spiders, put them in his lab. Now, first he tried castration. Don't do that. Spiders do not survive if you try and cut off one of their sex organs. However, if he let the males do it themselves, no problem. So he brings these spiders into his lab, some of them self-castrate, other ones don't, and then he and his, his team chase them around a little tiny track on the floor and see how long they last. What they find is that the males who have removed one of the two sex organs travel much faster and go twice as far as the remaining males. This is really important because these males have to get to the female first. For every male out there, there are, well, sorry, for every 10 males out there, there's one female. So, the one who has less sex organs, is the one who gets to mate. Um, this is a female with a male mating. If you can't see the male, he's right in the center there. So he really is a lot smaller. Now, you might think, why on earth would you end up with a female 
10 times the size, or 100 times the size of a male. I mean, this seems ridiculous, right? It's, I mean, the male has to mutilate, everything goes badly. Until you start to understand a little bit about, more about the sex of these animals and, and what happens. See, they're spiders. And spiders typically only have sex once. And for the males, since they've only got one sex organ, that's just fine. Because when they get to the female, they meet mate with her, they then die in place and leave part of themselves inside, blocking her off. So for both sexes, the sexual act is a one-off situation. So the female, she wants to be as large as possible so she can get as many eggs as she can, and the male wants to be as small as possible so he can be the one who gets to her. Okay, we're gonna leave the spider behind and, and switch gears a little bit, because that's an animal going out to find somebody else. But what about if you're an animal who is stuck to the rocks? We call these sessile animals, and usually we find them in oceans or rivers or streams, in water environments. Most sessile organs, organisms living on rocks have a very simple reproductive strategy. They release eggs and sperm out into the water. Those float around, they meet each other, and that's the end of the story. Babies are born. Very simple, not very efficient, but works quite well. Well, let's talk about barnacles. You've probably seen barnacles if you've ever been by the ocean. They're the ones that, well, when I was a kid, they were the ones that scratched my legs when I fell off the pier, but that's a whole other story. But in general, the, the kinds of organisms you see sitting on the rocks and posts all along the ocean edge. Now, here's what you probably don't know about barnacles, and that is they are descended from organisms that swam around in the ocean freely. When you swim around in the ocean, it's really easy. Male goes up to female, the two of them meet, sperm passes from one to the other, internal fertilization, you make babies. No problem. That's been left though, and now barnacles are stuck on rocks, and they still need internal fertilization. So, I'm standing over here, I'm stuck to my rock, and about you know three or four centimeters away, there's another barnacle. <laughs> this is not a very successful reproductive strategy. So what have barnacles done? They've developed a very long penis. <laughs> How long, you ask? up to four times their own body length. This is a very large organ. Um, they, they, they can reach out, touch their neighbor, touch their neighbor's neighbor, and keep going across. <laughs> and, and the nice thing about being a barnacle is that barnacles are actually hermaphroditic. That is, they have both male and female sex organs, which is great. You fertilize my eggs, I'll fertilize yours too. However, standing in one spot, penis goes out. How does it find the next barnacle? Well, that's another nice piece of the whole story because barnacles actually on the end of their penis, on the tip, have little sensory cells. They kind of sniff their way around. So, it's time for barnacle sex. The, the, uh, out from underneath the elbow comes out the penis, sniffs its way around, finds its way into another barnacle, and everything is good. That's great, except for one thing. So barnacles measure up. But barnacles live in intertidal zones. This is along the edge of the shore, which means that it can get pretty rough there. Lots and lots of waves. Penis is out, waves are coming across, penis comes off. This is not a good reproductive strategy. Now, Chris Newfield from the University of Alberta studied these guys, and he wondered, is there any adaptations they have to fit to different environments? And so he started measuring, this is a great, can you this is a, as a graduate program, measuring the penis of a barnacle? Anyway, <laughs> this, is, this is what Chris has done. He's gone out, he's measured penises from uh, barnacles in rough areas and in smooth areas where the water isn't so rough, like, you know, calmed areas. What he finds is if you take them from, a, from an area where it's uh, very smooth, then the penis actually gets smaller. If you move those same barnacles, or you look at barnacles that are found, uh, sorry, that's in a rough area. If you take those same barnacles, put them somewhere where it's smooth, Everything goes back to normal. So once again, size does matter, but if you're talking about barnacles, it depends on where you live. <laughs> okay, so we've looked on the land, we've looked in the water. Let's look at something that flies through the air. Ducks. Ducks are a really interesting uh, situation in the bird kingdom because ducks are one of only a few species, or a few groups of birds, that have a true phallus. So most bird species, it's a case that the males and the females get together, they match up the cloaca, that's the hole in the back where the poop comes out, match them up, sperm goes to eggs, everything's fine. But in ducks and ostriches and a couple other groups, they actually have a real sex organ. Now, the interesting thing is that while we've known that for a long time, because when the birds get together, they get very close and everything happens very quickly, very few people have actually seen a duck penis, but I've got one here for you now. Okay, this is the tip of a duck penis. 
you'll notice a couple of things about it. One of them is it's a corkscrew. Curious in and of itself. It also, you can't really tell from the picture, but it's also extremely bumpy. There's lots and lots of marks on the penis. And uh, when, when the research was done on this, the researchers wanted to look and see, well, how well does that match up with a female? Oh, I should point out, by the way, this is um, a, a short version. Most of them, the it's the same length as the body. So 45 centimeters. So you know, for a human, it would be like you know, about you know, six feet. Um, <laughs> yeah, that gives you some sense of the scale. So we've got this very, very large organ that is a corkscrew shape. Now, uh, when the researchers started to look at this, they wanted to see what would happen if they looked at the female reproductive tract, because there is two partners in this. We keep talking about the male here, and we're not hermaphroditic, so these birds, you have to have the females. When you look at the female's, uh, the female's reproductive system, you, get, you find it's a corkscrew as well. Now, it's a corkscrew, interestingly, with a bunch of dead ends in it. So it's not just one straight corkscrew down, but there are lots of side passages. Oh, and I should mention one other thing about it. It goes in the opposite direction. In other words, in a basic sense, it's very difficult for ducks to reproduce successfully. The female's entire reproductive system is set up to avoid mating. This doesn't seem like a very good reproductive strategy. Again, we have to turn to the biology of the organism to figure out why this is the case. If you look at ducks, when you look at them out in the field, and this will, change, this will change the way you think of ducks from here on in. <laughs> male ducks are not gentlemen. In fact, when a group of male ducks see a female, if it's breeding season, they will mob her. They will all come down at once, and they will all try and attempt to be the male who successfully breeds with her. As you can imagine, female ducks are not terribly impressed by this. They would like to have some input into the whole process. So, so what has happened? Well. Presumably, thousands of years ago, the, the early female ducks developed reproductive tracts that were just a little bit longer. Because, of course, that makes it harder for those males who are flying in and, and mobbing them to, to breed. So what happens with the male? His penis gets a bit longer. And, and we're talking, of course, in evolutionary terms here. So this is going on. Now, why the spiral then? Well, that's a packing problem. If you've ever seen how they send things up to the space shuttle, they don't just put everything out long. You know, the, the canada arm is all curled up and that comes out. This is a great way to fold up a penis. So you make it a nice spiral, and it fits into the space better. So you've got this evolutionary arms race going on between the males and females. The female is trying to get as long and complicated a, a, a system as possible to avoid the males, and the males are trying to keep up by getting a little bit longer and a little bit curlier each time. Unfortunately, they've taken slightly different strategies, which makes it that much more complicated. But you can see that these two things, we still have ducks, so obviously it does work but it slows down and helps the female avoid it. Presumably, there'll be detente at some point, and we'll end up with a maximum length of both the reproductive tract and the penis. But for now, who knows how long this could possibly get. Okay, so I said I was going to share three stories with you, and I have. We've got the spider that self-mutilates. We've got the, uh, the uh, barnacle that has a different length uh, organ, depending on where it is. And we've got the spirals of the duck. Why tell you these stories? Well, it could just be that I'm a freak and really interested in sex. And, and certainly, I could spend the next hour or two up here telling you more and more stories of weird animal sex. And there was a new one came out of the paper last week, so you know, there's lots and lots of this kind of stuff up there. But there's a deeper story here. Imagine for a second that you are a Martian. So you've just come to Earth, and you've sat down, and you've just caught this last couple of seconds where I went through what the strange things that the animals do are. You would think that biology on the planet Earth was insane, that it had no logic and no sense. I mean, let's face it, if you were going to create a barnacle, you wouldn't create something that had, uh, had, a, had to use an organ to get outside. You'd stick with the simpler version. This, this doesn't make a lot of sense if you were designing something like this. But when you look at it in an evolutionary historical context, you realize, well, the reason that the, uh, that, that the barnacle does that is because they're descended from creatures that were free living, that did swim around in the ocean. And so they're making the best of the tools that they have. The same with the spider. You know, you've got, you've got a size difference because you need to breed and, you've got, and, you, and you need to get rid of some of that and the easiest way to do that is just cut it off rather than anything else. And with the ducks, the whole length thing is because of the way that they interact with each other. All these things make sense when you look at them in the broader, longer perspective. And that is the first step in understanding evolution. The second step in this is that this is not a static thing. So we don't look at evolution today and think, this is it. 
And a lot of times you've heard the idea of, the, of survival of the fittest and everything getting to a certain point and that's the ideal. That's not the reality. The reality of evolution is that it's constantly changing. And reality isn't so, or evolution isn't so much survival of the fittest. It's survival of the fittest with the tools that you have based on where you came from. And where is it going to go? We don't know. A thousand years from now, it may be that barnacles have given up on this route. And in fact, some of the research that's starting to come out is suggesting that may be the case. Some species of barnacles are losing this long appendage and are st instead starting to use um, similar systems to those of some of the other organisms that live in the ocean. Because in the long run, it does make more sense to go that way. The ducks may get longer, may get shorter. The spiders, who knows, maybe somewhere in the evolutionary future, they will develop one organ that doesn't have to be ripped off for them to have sex. We just don't know. My point is, when you look around and when you hear stories about evolution or when you hear stories about animal sex, realize that what you've got is not an end point. It's a point on a journey, and it's, you can see evolution in a whole different way. Thank you.